We have the Chevron case. Oh, okay, guys. Oh, come on, where's my case? Don't tell me, don't spoil it. No spoilers in chat. Chevron is overruled. Yes, let's go. <coughs> let's go. Yes! 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 Let's go! Woo! 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 We are the champions, my friends. Bum, ba. We'll keep on fighting to the end. Ba, 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 ba. We are the champions. We are the champions. No time for losers. We are the champions of the world. Woo! Woo! It's glorious. It's glorious. Nom 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 it's so glorious. Awesome. It's great. Oh all right. Woo I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm so happy. So, you know, after after uh, careful judicial consideration and after sober review, I have decided that I believe this decision of the U.S. Supreme Court is correct. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Witch, oh, witch, the wicked witch. Ding dong, the wicked witch is dead. Da, da, da. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Witch, oh, witch, the wicked witch. Ding dong, the wicked witch is dead. Da, 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 da. To summarize that for non-lawyer speak, I, I will now I will now explain it for the non-lawyers in the audience. Okay. The federal government, the executive branch specifically, is charged to do much stuff. They are charged to do many things. There are different statutes that give different parts of the executive branch the power to do different things. The EPA has a statute saying EPA do EPA things. You know, the Federal Trade Commission has a statute that says FTC, do FTC things, and so forth and so on, right? So the, there are statutes giving these various agencies the power to do the things that agencies decided to do, okay? So if the statute is ambiguous, which, you know, it often is in parts, if the statute is ambiguous, then we have to go figure out what the statute means. Up until right this second, since 1984, so literally for the last 40 years, for the last 40 years, if the statute was ambiguous, the agency that is given the power is the one to decide what the statute means, okay? So for example, we have the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Hey, EPA, here's a statute that says, here's what you can do. And someone says, you know what? I think this part of the statute is ambiguous. It's not exactly clear what Congress had in mind. And so I'd like to figure out exactly what Congress had in mind. And up in, for, so for the last 40 years, if you want to figure it out, who do you ask? You ask the EPA. You ask the EPA. The EPA is the one that was given the, the power by the statute. And you want to decide how much power the EPA has by the statute. So what you do is you ask the EPA how much power the statute gives them. You, do, you, do you get it? Do you get it? You have given a statute, you have written a statute that gives power to the EPA. You are unclear about how much power the statute gives the EPA. Who do you ask? The EPA. The EPA is the one that decides how much power the statute that enables the EPA gives the EPA. So the EPA is the one that interprets 
how much power they have. Okay? Do you get it now? Do you get it now? All right? So, you know, this has been a bit of a problem. Because, amazingly, it seems, every single time you ask the agency, how much power do they have, the answer has always been yes. How much power do you have? Yes. That doesn't answer my question. It really does. And so the agencies have, su un, su have somewhat surprisingly interpreted the statutes to give them more power. And the courts, the courts have been bound by that. The courts were required to agree. So when you said, hey, you know, I'm not sure EPA that this statute should be understood that way. I'm not sure that the EPA should have more power. I'm going to go to court to complain about it. The court was required to say, the court was required to say the EPA was right. It, you know, EPA, you, you must, you must be right. I mean, you must be right. You're the one, that, you're the one that's been given the power by the statute. Who better to interpret, who better to interpret what the statute means that gives you power other than the agency that ha that's been given the power? Who, who would be better equipped than the agency themselves that's been given the power to interpret how much power they have? EPA, you must be right. You must be right. You're right every single time. You are, you are correct every single time. You're always right. You're always right every single time. And then sometimes they'd even change their mind from administration to administration because the EPA would say, for example, you know what? We don't have this power. We don't have this power. We do not have the power to do this thing. And the court would say, hey, you must be right. You must be right that you don't have the power to do this thing. I mean, after all, you're the EPA. You're the one that's been given the power to decide how much power you have. And you've been you've decided that you don't have the power. So you must be right. And then sometimes they change their mind back and say, we do have the power. And they go to court again and say, hey, well, you must be right. And it's like, wait a second, court. They said literally the opposite thing four years ago. And you said that they were right then when they said literally exactly the opposite. Yeah, they were right because that's what they said then. They said exactly the opposite and they were right. And they then they're saying exactly the opposite now. That's right. They are saying exactly the opposite now. Well, they can't be right both times. Yes, they can. They can be right both times because who better than, than the agency themselves to decide how much power they had. So they said, they said A and then they said not A. And they were right both times. It means both A and not A. It means exactly this, and it means exactly the opposite of this. Who are we to disagree? The agency themselves must know what it means, so they can say it means this and exactly the opposite of this, and, it, and no problem. Their interpretation is always correct every single time. It's amazing. It's a slot machine that you can't stop winning on. And the Supreme Court just decided that was kind of dumb. And, you know, maybe, maybe the, the Supreme Court basically said, you know what, might be good. Maybe, maybe not the agency themselves that's been given the power. Maybe the agency themselves that's been given the power maybe shouldn't be the one to decide how much power they have. That sounds like that might be a bit of a conflict of interest. And maybe they aren't always right every single time, even if they change their mind. Maybe maybe they aren't always right. Maybe someone independent of the agency that's been given the power should decide how much power the agency has. Maybe someone independent should decide it. Like maybe, I don't know, for example, a court. Maybe a court. Yeah, that sounds good. Are, aren't, aren't courts ones that usually decide law? I mean, that's, I mean, that's usually what they do. They usually interpret law. So maybe, maybe the court should be the one that interprets the law instead of the agency. Maybe, maybe we'll give that a try. Maybe the agency should, maybe the agency shouldn't be the one to interpret law. Maybe it should be the judicial branch instead. Let's, let's try the judicial branch interprets the law and see how that goes. So that's what just happened. Did I adequately explain it for all the people who are wondering what the hell's going on? The Chevron is dead. The Chevron is dead. We use poisonous gases and we poisoned its asses. The Chevron is dead. Chevron is dead. The Chevron is dead. Chevron is dead. Poisonous gases and we poisoned its asses, which is particularly ironic because Chevron dealt with the Clean Air Act, so using poisonous gas is particularly ironic in this context. The F Chevron is dead. Bah, 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 bah. All right. Yeah, no, this, this this decision does not affect Beef Fish. Beef Fish is still alive and well because Beef Fish was a decision under state law. So the, the Beef Fish remains. The Beef Fish remains because it was an interpretation of a statu state statute, not federal. So... <laughs> 
The the bee fish, the bee, the bee fish is safe. The bee fish will continue to thrive. Chevron. Chevron. Chevron is dead. Chevron is dead. Chevron. Chevron. Chevron is dead. All right, let's go. Looper Bright Enterprises versus Ramonda, Secretary of Commerce. The court grants certiorari in these cases is limited to the question about whether Chevron versus NRD should be overruled or clarified. Under the Chevron doctrine, courts have sometimes been required to defer to permissible agency interpretations of statutes those agencies administer, even while a reviewing court reads the statute differently. In each case below, the reviewing court applies Chevron framework to resolve in favor of governmental challenges by petitioners to a rule promulgated by National Marine Fisheries Services pursuant to the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, which incorporates the Administrative Procedures Act. Hell, the Administrative Procedures Act, close other tabs, the Administrative Procedures Act requires courts to exercise their independent judgment in deciding whether an agency has acted within a statutory authority and courts may not defer to an agency interpretation of law simply because the statute are, is ambiguous. Article 3 of the Constitution assigns the judiciary the responsibility and power to adjudicate cases and controversies, concrete disputes with consequences for the parties involved. The framers appreciated that laws judges would necessarily apply in resolving those disputes would not always be clear, but envisioned that the final interpretation of law would be the proper and peculiar province of the court. As Chief Justice Marshall declared in the foundational decision of Marbury versus Madison, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. In the decades that followed Marbury, when the meaning of the statute was an issue, the judicial role was to interpret the act of Congress in order to ascertain the rights of the person. The court recognized from the outset, though, that the exercising independent judgment often included according due respect to the executive branch's interpretation. Such respect was thought especially warranted when the executive branch's interpretation was issued roughly contemporaneously with enactment of the statute and remained consistent over time, which kind of makes sense because if the executive, for example, the president is giving a signing statement, it at least gives some clue as to what he thought he was signing. So it might be some sort of indicia that might provide some sort of understanding as to what was going on. The court also gave most respectful consideration to court the executive branch interpretations simply because the officers, officers were concerned were usually able men and masters of the subject who may have well drafted the law. Respect, though, was just that. The views of the executive branch could inform the judgment of the judiciary, but it did not supersede it. The, in cases where a court's own judgment differed from that of other high functionaries, the court was not at liberty to surrender or waive it. The Supreme Court decided Chevron in the first place in 1984. During the rampant expansion of the administrative process that took place during the New Deal era, the court often treated administration determinations of fact as binding on the court, provided there was evidence to support the finding. But the court did not extend similar deference to agency reasonings of questions of law. The interpretation of the meaning of the statute as applied to judicial controversies remained exclusively judicial. In other words, if you're not sure what the law means, Go ask the people that decide what law means. In other words, the courts. The court also continued to note that the informed judgment of the executive branch could be entitled to great weight. The weight of such judgment in a particular case, the court observed, would depend upon the thoroughness of the evidence and consideration, the validity of reasoning. It's consistent with earlier and later pronouncements and all those factors which give power to persuade if lacking power to control, which makes sense. That is far, far, far enough as it goes. To the ability, it has the ability to persuade, it has the ability to persuade. That's, that's fair enough as far as it goes. Occasionally during this period, the court applied deferential review after concluding a particular statute empowered an agency to decide how broad the statutory term applied to specific founds found by the agency. 
So the agency got to decide how much power it had. But such deferential review, which the court was far from consistent in applying, was cabined to a fact-bound determination. And the court did not purport to refashion the long-standing judicial approach of law. It instead proclaimed that undoubtedly questions of statutory interpretation are for the courts to resolve, giving appropriate weight to the judgment of those whose special duty it is to administer the question statute. Nothing in the New Deal era or before it thus resembles the deferential rule the court would begin applying later to all varieties of agency interpretation under Chevron. Congress enacted in 1946 enacted the APA as a check upon the administration whose zeal might have carried others of them to excess not contemplated in the legislative created of the office. So Congress created the Administrative Procedures Act, which is basically a rule for rules. Is a rule for rules. The Administrative Procedures Act says, hey, all agencies, here's how you create rules. Here's the process to create rules. Here's the process to go about doing that. And here's also how the rules that you create should be understood. So it's a rule for rules. And it was created by Congress. So fine. It is now a master template. Here's how you create a rule. Here's how you amend a rule. Here's how rules should be understood and interpreted. Cool. Fine. The Administrative Procedure Act prescribes procedure for agency action, which also, by the way, doesn't merely limit to rules. It, it also extends to basically anything the agency does. So not just rules, but just any agency action that has external impact. So if an agency is doing something purely internally, probably not the APA, but if the APA is doing something externally, in other words, they're trying to do something to you or something that impacts you, then probably the APA does apply, whether that's a creation of a rule or application of a rule or whatever. The APA says how to understand whether or not they're doing something that's lawful. And it covers all agencies, except of course, we're specifically excluded. But you know, every agency that's likely to have impact on your life through rulemaking, as opposed to law enforcement authority in particular. Okay. And it codifies for the agency the case that unremarkable yet elemental proposition reflected by judicial practice dating back to Marbury. Courts decide legal questions by applying their own judgment. As relevant here, the Administrative Procedure Act specifies that courts, not agencies, will decide all relevant questions of law arising on review of agency action, even those involving ambiguous law, because that's what courts do. It prescribes no deferential standard for courts to employ in answering these legal questions, despite mandating deferential judicial review of the policymaking and fact-finding. So the agency gets to decide, well, deference at least, they get deference as to the facts, they get deference as to understanding of the facts, and they get deference as to their decisions about what to do about things. But as to their underlying power, not so much. Yeah, the decision about January 6th has also been decided. That's, that's, that's interesting. But I'm talking about the really interesting case, Chevron. So that's what we're doing now. That, that Jan 6th case is kind of interesting, but, it's, but Chevron was decided. So we're, we're doing that. Um, directing courses to interpret constitutional statutory provisions without deference to the two, it makes clear that agencies' interpretation, like agencies' interpretation of the Constitution, are not entitled to deference. They don't get the deference to decide what the law means. The AP's history and contemporary views of various respected commentaries underscore the plain meaning of the text. Courts exercise independent judgment in determining the meaning of statutory provisions consistent with the Administrative Procedures Act may, as they have from this heart, seek aid of those interpretation. So the agencies might have some insight on what they mean. They can provide their thoughts on the subject. That's, that's fine. They have the experience and knowledge and stuff, so they can offer a lot of thoughts about what they think the statute means. That's, that's fine. And when the best reading of a statute is that it delegates discretionary authority, the role of the reviewing court under the APA is to independently interpret the statute and effectuate the, role, the will of Congress. So if it gives deference to the agency, that's what Congress intended. That's fine. And it often will do, right? It might say something as simple as the national parks shall have operating hours for its parks. 
And maybe that's all that Congress said. You shall have operating hours. And then, well, what does that mean? Well, Congress gave it to you to mean. Maybe this particular park should have 24-7 operating hours. And maybe this particular national park should only be open an hour per year. Which presumably would be informed by what the national park is, environmental conditions, access conditions, you know, impact by human beings versus the nature environment, and so forth and so on. This national park should let in 10,000 people a day. This national park should let in 10. As long as that decision is based off of factors such as environmental concerns, safety concerns, facility concerns, so forth and so on, then it's probably fine because Congress wanted you to figure out as long as you do it in any reasonable way, that's fine. So, you know, fair enough. That makes sense. As long as it's not arbitrary and capricious, as long as it's based on some reasons you can point to, hey, why are you, why are you letting 10,000 people in this park and only 10 in this park? Well, as it happens, this park that we're only letting 10 people into is particularly environmentally sensitive. Here are the reasons it's particularly environmentally sensitive. Also, it's really remote. So we don't have the ability to really provide facilities and we don't have the ability to clean up 10,000 people's trash and such. So we have to keep it, you know, we have to keep it to only 10 people, and those people have to be specifically vetted to make sure they're not going to fuck up the national environment and so forth and so on. And the court will be like, oh, okay, that makes sense. That's that's fine, as long as you can point, point reasons to it, right? But if, if Congress says, you know, less than that, if they don't give you that discretion, then, you know. But the question is, what did Congress say? The question is always, what did Congress say? Did they mean for you to have this much latitude or they didn't mean? What did they say? That's the question. Does this mean Congress has to create laws? It does, in fact, mean Congress has to create laws. I know. It's scary for everyone. Courts exercising independent judgment consistent with the APA seek the interpretation of those statutes. See Skidmore. Let's make Skidmore great again. The court fulfills that role by recognizing constitutional delegation, fixing the boundaries of the authority, and ensuring the agency has reasoned decision-making within those borders. So we get to decide what the borders are, and as long as you have authority, anything that makes any sense will be fine. As long as it's not arbitrary and capricious, it'll be fine. As long as it makes basically any sense. By doing so, the court upholds the traditional conception of judicial function. The deference that Chevron requires of courts reviewing agencies cannot be squared with the APA. Chevron decided in 1984 by a bare quorum of six justices, the U.S. Supreme Court needs at least six justices to decide a case by statute. So six is six is a quorum for the Supreme Court, not five. So they had six. Triggered a marked departure from the traditional judicial approach of independently examining the statute. The question in that particular case is whether the EPA's regulation was consistent with the term stationary source as used in the Clean Air Act. Okay, we'll talk very, very briefly about the facts of Chevron, not that it particularly matters, okay? In Chevron, they were trying to determine, like, for power plants, what a, what a source was. What's a source of pollution? And there were a couple different ways to potentially interpret this question, okay? Maybe a source of pollution, for example, is each individual smokestack, right? So you have, let's say, a coal plant, right? You have a coal plant. And maybe a source of pollution is each individual stack. Or maybe, for example, it's each independent furnace, even if the furnace has more than one stack. So maybe it's not the stacks. Maybe it's the furnaces. Or maybe it's the plant as a whole. Maybe it doesn't matter how many furnaces and, sta and stacks they have. Maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe we should be looking at, at this as a plant-wide measure. The plant is an emission source. So these are potentially a couple different ways to interpret this, right? The plant as a whole is an immersion, immersion, emission source. A furnace is an emission source. A smokestack is an emission source. And it matters. It matters. Because depending on how you interpret it, it might influence what, a, what, a, what they may or may not be able to do. And potentially ways that might actually be environmentally friendly if you interpret it a particular way, right? So maybe, you know, if you view it by stack by stack, maybe putting up a cleaner stack is good, even if it increases overall emission. 
maybe that's good. Maybe if they put up a new furnace and a new stack, but it burns cleaner, maybe that's okay. Because well, they put up a new they put up a, a new stack and it's in, and it's better and it, it's cleaner, even if it increases overall emission. Maybe that's okay. Or maybe it's not okay. But either way, you got to figure out what we're talking about, right? So we try to figure out what exactly is the source of pollution. What exactly is that? That was what Chevron was supposed to be about. And then the Supreme Court kind of decided not to decide the issue, really, because they said, EPA, it's up to you to figure it out, and we don't care. You, you figure it out. So to answer that question and basically answer all questions that would follow, the court then came up with a two-step approach. The first step was to determine whether Congress had spoken directly. So if Congress was clear, Congress was clear. But Congress usually isn't clear. Usually there's some ambiguity because it's really hard to write a really clean law or really clear law. And most of the time you don't really want to, to be quite honest, because you don't really know what's going to happen in the future. So most of the time you don't want to. But in a case where the statute was silent or ambiguous with respect to the specific issue, our reviewing court could not simply impose its own construction as that would be as would be necessary in the absence of administration. So if it's ambiguous, the court can't decide it. Instead, at Chevron's second court, a court had, the court had, the court had to defer to the agency if it even offered a permissible construction of the statute, even if the reading would not have been the reading reached by the court. So as long as they came up with a reading that was plausible, they win. No matter what their reading is, they always win. As long as it's permissible, as long as it could be read that way, it must be read that way. And the agency is the one that gets to decide and they get to change their mind. All right. So employing this test, the court concluded that Congress had not addressed the question, which is fair enough. They had not. I will agree. This, the term is ambiguous. So yes, what exactly is a, an emission source? What exactly is a stationary source? What exactly is that? I will agree that it was unclear. Having decided it was unclear, they're like, the EPA can win. The EPA wins. Whatever they think works for us. We don't care. EPA, your interpretation is good enough. It's fine. All right. Although the court did not first treat Chevron as the watershed it was fated to become, the court and the Court of Appeals were soon routinely involving the framework as the governing standard in cases involving statutory question of all agency authority. So all agency authority should be understood this way. The court eventually decided that Chevron rested on a presumption that Congress, when it left an ambiguity in the statute meant for implementation by the agency, understood the ambiguity would be resolved by the agency and desired that the agency decide it. Okay? So the court said, okay, if it's ambiguous, what Congress wants is the agency to decide the ambiguity. And, you know, what is the agency going to decide? Well, whatever's convenient for them in any given moment. You know, that's what they're going to decide. Sounds okay to us. No problem. The, the agency, the agents, the, 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 who decides, who decides what the governing standard is? The person that's governed by the governing standard. They decide what the governing standard is. So you've, you've given them the authority to decide how much authority they have. Wow. I don't see any problem with that. Neither Chevron nor any subsequent decision of the court attempted to reconcile its framework within the APA. Chevron defies the command of the APA that the reviewing court, not the agency whose action it reviews, decides all relevant questions of law and interprets the statutory provisions. It requires the court to ignore, not follow, the reading of the court the court would have reached had it exercised its independent judgment. The, the, the court isn't right. The statute's right. Chevron insists on more than respect, given the executive branch. It demands the court mechanically afford binding deference to the agencies, even including those that have been inconsistent over time, citing Brand X. So Chevron said, hey, agency, you could decide what the statute means. And then Brand X said, hey, agency, 
you get to change your mind. Any reasonable interpretation will do. If both A and not A are reasonable interpretation, you can say A one moment and not A the next, and they're both correct. Remind you, this isn't where the statute says either A or not A will be, a be fine, which you could do, right? This, the Congress could do that. They could say national parks could be, they could say, you know what? Uh, national Park Service, you can decide whether a national park is open or closed. They could do that, right? So A or not A would be fine. And then they could decide, okay, this national park is open. This national park is closed. And they could change their mind as situations might change. You know, we said open, but on better reflection, we think closed. Why did we change our mind? Well, you know, it turns out that people are slobs and they're leaving trash everywhere. And we've tried to mitigate it and people suck ass and they're destroying the environment and we don't really like it anymore. And so we're just going to close the whole, we're going to shut the whole thing down because people suck balls. Be like, oh, okay. And this park that was closed, it was open. Well, why, why are you going to change your mind? Well, is it determined, you know, we determined that there really wasn't that much interest in it. You know, it's going to be fine. We can manage it. You know, we got, we got more, we got more employees. We got more staff. We can figure it out. We'll be able to ha handle it. It'll be fine. I'll be oh, okay. Right. But that isn't the situation, right? We're, we're trying to interpret an ambiguity. We're trying to interpret an ambiguity, not so it's like, okay, well, the ambiguity means A or not A. And who decides that? The agency itself. And they get to change their mind. And either one, you're correct. So we're now in a position where the where the where the agency gets to overrule the court, which has happened. It has happened. Right? The agency says A, and the people say, well, that's wrong. They sue the agency. It goes through the court and the court of appeals. The court of appeals says, no, A is the correct interpretation. The court of appeals says A is the correct interpretation. You know, four years later, a new administration takes over and they say not A. And the people say, wait a second, the court of appeals said A. They, they made a decision. They said A. And they said, well, we changed our mind. It's not A. And the court of appeals said, well, you know, hey, they changed their mind. It must be not A. And so we're in the position now where the agency gets to overrule the court of appeals as to interpretations of law in a way that potentially benefits the agency itself that's providing the interpretation. So that was brand X. Chevron is you get to decide what how, Chevron was. You get to decide how much authority you have. Brand X is you get to change your mind on basically whatever whim pleases you, whatever, whatever fancies your whim at any given moment. So that regime is the antithesis of the time honored approach. The APA says, yeah, the APA says courts, you should decide. And Chevron says, not only does agency get to decide, they also get to overrule law. They get to decide law and they get to overrule law. They're both, they're both the court and the Court of Appeals and the U.S. Supreme Court all rolled up into one. And no one has a problem with this, apparently. Chevron cannot be reconciled with the Administrative Procedures Act by presuming statutory ambig ambiguities are implicit delegations. Yeah, that's, that's a hell of an assumption. If it's ambiguous, it must, implicit means required. Right? To say something's implicit is to say it's logically necessary. It's implied, is implicit. So if it's ambiguous, it must mean the agency is to decide the issue. N no. No. I agree it could be. Maybe the correct interpretation is this is meant to give the agency deference. Maybe, maybe the correct inter I'm not beyond saying the correct interpretation is the agency should have the flexibility. That might be the correct interpretation of the ambiguity. It could be true. But to say it must be true? Nope. That's some bullshit. A ambiguity does not necessarily reflect the congressional intent that the agency as opposed to courts must resolve the interpretation question. Who gets to decide what the law means after all? Isn't that sort of what the judicial branch is supposed to do? 
And you know what happens if the judicial branch gets it wrong? Even in the Supreme Court, even if it's the Supreme Court, you know what happens if the Supreme Court makes a decision 9-0 and says the statute means X? You know what happens next or could happen next? 9-0, the Supreme Court says the statute means X. Well, what could happen next? Congress could be like, no, that's some bullshit. It means why, you idiots? Because Congress writes statutes. Geez, Supreme Court, that was a really dumb way to interpret our statute. Don't know what the fuck you were reading. But, you know, let's help you out, you stupid idiots. Let's clarify this because, you know, you're, about, you're a bunch of dum-dums and don't understand what we wrote. So we're going to fix it so you understand, so you won't be so stupid next time. Yes, Congress can overrule the Supreme Court on statutory interpretation. That's what's supposed to happen. So Congress can overrule the Supreme Court. No problem. Just pass a new statute. <sighs> Congress, do your job. Many or perhaps most ambiguities may be unintentional. And when can courts confront ambiguities in cases that do not involve discretion, they are not somehow relieved of their obligation to independently interpret. Instead of declaring a party's reading permissible, courts should use every tool at their disposal to determine the best reading. Well, that sounds fun. Why don't we just use the statutory interpretation tools, which incidentally are the exact same tools as far as I'm considered, as far as if you ask me, the statutory interpretation tools are the exact same tools you'd use if you're trying to determine what a regulation means or the Constitution means. Right? They're the exact same tools. We have these tools. We've had them forever. They're great tools. Let's use the tools. Let's make the tools great again. And we can properly understand what the Constitution slash statute slash reg regulation means. They're there for a reason. They've, they've been around for common law because they work. Let's go do that. And if we're wrong, there's a way to fix it. Congress, do your job. But in an agency case, as any other, there is a best reading all the same, the reading the court would have reached if no agency were involved. Right, because it's the court that's supposed to interpret law. So, you know, it should probably be up to the court. It therefore makes no sense to speak of a permissible tool that's not one of the court. Yeah, perhaps most fundamentally, Chevron's presumption is misguided because agencies have no special competence in resolving statutory ambiguities. If you're trying to figure out what the law means, they're, they're not particularly well equipped to figure that out. Courts do that. That's what courts are for. That's why they were invented. The framers anticipated that courts would often confront statutory ambiguities and expect courts would resolve them by exercising independent legal judgment. Chevron gravely erred spicy language, gravely aired, spicy language, in concluding the inquiry is fundamentally different just because the administrative issue interpretation is at play. Chevron is dead, let's bury it deep. The very point of the traditional tools of statutory construction is to resolve the statutory ambiguity. That is no less true when the ambiguity is about the scope of the agency's own power, perhaps the occasion on which abdication in favor of the agency is least appropriate. This sentence... This sentence is the ball game, basically. It is not less true that the court should decide this when the issue is how much power the agency has. In fact, it's kind of more true. It's not less true that courts should decide it if the issue is how much power should the agency have. It's more true. Yeah. The government responds that Congress must generally intend for agencies to resolve statutory ambiguities because agencies have subject matter expertise regarding the statutes they administer. Insofar as that's true, that's true. They do have subject matter expertise. That's true. Because deferring to agencies purportedly promotes uniform construction of federal law and because resolving statutory ambiguities can involve policymaking best left to political actors rather than the court. 
But none of these considerations justifies Chevron's sweeping presumption of intent. As the court recently noted, interpretive issues arising in connection with a regulatory scheme may fall more naturally into a judge's ballywick than an agency's. Under Chevron's broad rule of deferences, though, ambiguities of all stripes trigger deference, even in cases having little to do with agency's technical subject matter expertise. Right. Because the rule applies regardless, even if they don't have much particular expertise in the thing they're being asked to do. And when an ambiguity happens to implicate a technical matter, it does not in follow that Congress has taken the power to authoritatively interpret the statute away from the court and given it to the agency. Congress expects courts to handle technical statutory questions, and court did so without issue before Chevron. They sure did. After all, an agency case in particular, the reviewing court will go about its task with the agency's body of experience and informed judgment, among other information at its disposal. See, for example, Skidmore makes Skidmore great again. An agency's interpretation of a statute cannot bind a court, but may be especially informative to the extent it relies on a factual premise within the agency. Delegating ultimate interpretive authority to the agency is simply not necessary to ensure the resolution of ambiguities well informed by subject matter expertise. Nor does the desire for uniform construction of federal law justify Chevron. It's unclear how much the Chevron doctrine as a whole actually promotes such uniformity, and in any event, we see no reason to presume that Congress performs uniformity for uniformity's sake over the correct interpretation of law. Facts. Finally, the view that interpretation of ambiguity statutory provision amounts to policymaking suited for political actors rather than the courts is especially mistaken because it reflects a profound misconception of the judicial role. Resolution of ambiguity involves legal interpretation, and that task does not suddenly become policymaking just because a court has an agency to fall back on. Courts interpret statutes no matter the context based on traditional tools of construction, not individual policy preferences. Preach. To stay out of discretionary policymaking left to the political branches, judges need only fulfill their obligation under the APA to independently identify and respect such delegations of authority, police outside statutory boundaries of those delegations, and ensure those agencies exercise their discretion consistent with the APA. By forcing courts to instead pretend ambiguities are necessarily a delegation, Chevron prevents judges from judging because it certainly does. Because Chevron's justifying presumption is, as members of the court have recognized, a fiction, the court has spent the better part of four decades imposing one limitation on Chevron after another. Confronted with a Byzantine set of preconditions and exceptions that have resulted, some courts have simply bypassed Chevron or failed to heed its various steps and nuances. The court, for its part, has not deferred to an agency interpretation under Chevron since 2016. But because Chevron remains on the books, Litigants must continue to wrestle with it, and lower courts, bound by even this court's crumbling precedent, understandably continue to apply it. At best, Chevron has become a distraction from the question that matters. Does the statute authorize the challenge agency action? And at worst, it requires courts to violate the Administrative Procedure Act by yielding to the agency the express responsibility vested in the reviewing court to decide all relevant questions of law. Maybe the court should decide it, not so much the agency. Starry decisive, the doctrine governing judicial adherence to precedent does not require the court to persist in the Chevron project. The starry decisive consideration most relevant here, the quality of the precedent's reasoning, the workability of the rule it established, and reliance, reliance on the decision. Citing Nick versus Township, quoting Janus, and you could also cite O'Connor's decision in um, Casey versus Planned Parenthood for this exact same sort of proposition. Chevron has reproved all fundamental to prove to be fundamentally misguided. It reshaped judicial review of the agency without grip, grappling the APA, the statute that lays out the review works. As flaws were apparent from the start, prompting the court to revise its foundations and continuing limit application. Experience has shown Chevron is unworkable. The defining feature of its framework is identification of a statutory ambiguity, but the concept of ambiguity has evaded definition. So it's ambiguous, What's ambiguous? Such an since an impressionate and malleable concept cannot stand as an everyday test for allocating interpretive authority between courts and agencies. The court has also been forced to clarify the doctrines again and again, 
only adding to Chevron's unworkability, and the doctrine continues to spawn different threshold questions that promise to further complicate the inquiry should Chevron be retained. And its continuing import is far from clear, as courts have often declined to engage with the doctrine, saying it makes no difference. Nor has Chevron fostered meaningful reliance. Given the court's constant tinkering with and eventually turning away from Chevron, it's hard to see how any particular reason expect a court could rely on Chevron in a particular case or expect it to produce a readily foreseeable outcome. And rather than safeguarding reliance interests, Chevron affirmatively destroys them by allowing agencies to change course even when Congress has given them no power to do so. The only way to ensure the law will not meaningfully change erratically but will develop in a principled and intelligent fashion is for the court to leave Chevron behind. By overruling Chevron, though, the court does not call into question prior cases that relied on Chevron's framework. The holdings of those cases that specify agency actions are lawful, including the Clean Air Act of holding a Chev Chevron itself, are still subject to statutory stare decisis, despite the court's change in interpretive methodology. Mere reliance on Chevron cannot, continue, cannot constitute special justification for overruling a holding. So all the prior decisions are valid, but frozen into place. So I guess... So all so we don't so all the decisions that rely on Chevron are still valid, even if Chevron itself is invalid, which I suppose is fine because the, the Supreme Court didn't really want to redo 40 years worth of case law. But at least everyone knows what it means now. So that's nice. Chevron delivered the opinion of the court in which a whole bunch of people joined. Kagan filed a dissent in which Sotomayor Jordan complained and, you know, said some bullshit. So that makes logical sense. So that's good. Shall we spend a little time with the dissent and watch them whining? The Chevron is dead. Chevron is dead. The Chevron is dead. Chevron is dead. Dun, 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 dun. The poison their asses. The Chevron is dead. Chevron is dead. Chevron is dead. Chevron is dead. Justice Kagan. For 40 years, Chevron has served as a cornerstone of administrative law, allocating responsibility for statutory construction between court and agencies. Under Chevron, a court uses all normal interpretive tools to decide whether Congress has spoken to an issue. If the court finds Congress has done so, that's the end of the matter. The agency's views make no difference. But if the court finds it's the end of its interpretive work, that Congress has left a gap, then the choice must be made. Who should give the content as the statute when Congress instructions have run out? Should it be the court or should it be the agency the Congress is charged with? The answer Chevron gives it should usually be left to the agency within the bounds of reasonableness. And that goes pretty far. It has been applied in thousands of judicial decisions. It sure has. It's become a part of the warp and wharf of modern government. The warp and woof? The warp and woof of modern government. Okay, you, you got me. I don't know what that means. What is the warp and woof of modern government? What the hell does woof mean in this sentence? Woof, noun. Woven fabric, the texture of a fabric, a basic or essential element of material. Okay, I have learned a new meaning of a word today. Woof, woof means woven fabric, the texture of a fabric, a basic or essential element or material. Uh, okay, um, uh, all right. W woof, w woof, uh, 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 all right, fine. It has become part of the warp and woof. All right, what, what exactly does warp mean in this sentence? I think I know what it means, but I, I'm just gonna double check. Isn't warp bad in this context? Okay, warp, a warp is a series of yarns extended lengthwise in a loom and crossed by the weft. A twist or curve that's developed in something flat. So apparently we're, apparently we're using a uh, crocheting metaphor or a looming metaphor. Uh, all right. Um, okay. Uh, all right. We're 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 talking about looms, I guess, for some reason. 
It has become part of the warp and woof of modern government, supporting regulatory efforts of all kinds, to name a few, keeping air and water clean, food and drug safe, and financial markets are. Yeah, warp are the threads running through the weaver. I I I got I got that now. I I picked up on that. And the rule is right. The court has long understood Chevron deference to reflect what Congress would want. Uh huh. Congress knows that it does not, in fact, cannot write perfectly complete regulatory statutes. It knows those statutes will invariably contain ambiguities that some other actor will have to resolve and gaps some other actor will have to fill. And it will usually prefer that actor to be the responsible agency, not the court. Well, that's not what the APA seems to say. Some interpretive issues arising of the regulatory context involve scientific or technical matters. So dogs, so dogs are talking about weaving. I didn't know that dogs were looming experts, but okay. Maybe I could ask Chloe about the finer points of looming and weaving and crochet and such. Agencies have experts in these areas. Courts do not. Some demand a detailed understanding of complex, interdeterminate regulatory programs. Agencies know these programs inside and out. Courts do not. And some present policy choices, including trade-offs between competing goods. Agencies report to a president, who in turn answers the public for his policy calls. Courts have no such accountability and no proper basis for making policy. They're not. They're interpreting law. And if you don't like it, talk to Congress. Today, the court flips the scripts. Is now the court rather than the agency that wield the power when Congress is left an area of interpretive discretion. Sounds like what courts are supposed to do. A rule of judicial humanity gives way to a rule of judicial hubris. In recent years, this court has too often taken itself for a decision maker. The court has substituted its own judgment for that of OSHA. Really? We're going back to the vaccine? Its own judgment of student loans. But evidently, that was for the court all too piecemeal. One field scoop, the majority today gives itself exclusive power over every open issue, no matter how expertisely driven or pay policy lane, involving the meaning of regulatory law. And if it does not have enough on its plate, the majority turns itself into the country's administrative czar. It defends that move as one, suddenly required by the nearly 80 year old APA, but the act makes no such demand. Today's decision is not one Congress directed, it is entirely the majority's choice. Well, that sounds like some bullshit. So I, I'll, I'll sharply disagree with Kagan on this one. I'm all right. No one needs to worry about me. I'm all right. Please just let me be. Wow. All right. Kurt, what do you have going? Yeah, I'll be doing Verdict Watch for Karen Reed. And then I think after that, I'm going to print out the entirety of the uh, new Chevron decision and possibly get myself an inflatable pool of some kind and do, an, a, do a hot tub stream, stream <laughs> swimming in the waters of the Chevron decision as I slowly bathe myself with a ladle with the pages of the decision. Should be exciting. So you can tune in for that content, perhaps only on Twitch. Check out for that. All right. Well, 